and so as you do first prop more and more and more. But specifically, never define a motion to try and exclude a set of arguments. Never define a motion to try and run away from arguments. Go for something which is simple and clear and brave in 99% of cases. There are sometimes debates where the only way to win them is to do something a bit funky. Um, but in the vast majority of cases, really, like for winning from first prop is about giving the judge what they want, and what they, they don't want fireworks, what they want is for you to not fuck it up. Can you give us an example? An example of a mad, mad overprop, or an no, example of... Both. The thin well, line. Can you give your example from Astros, the one you've told? Ah, okay, so... <laughs> so this sound... The motion was something like holding community leaders, community religious leaders responsible for the crimes of their community. Boom. Um, and we said this is a very broad debate. Uh, we'd like, in defining it, to give it a bit of focus. Uh, by community leaders, we mean the Pope. Um, and by responsible for crimes, uh, we mean the systematic rape and abuse of hundreds of thousands of children over the last century, if not longer. So we're going to arrest him, take him to The Hague, try him for crimes against humanity. We might take the conclave of cardinals with him. We might dig up all the other popes and try them ex post facto as well. We're going to have a legal team, like an army. It's going to have an unlimited budget, and we're going to televise the whole thing. Um, so, totally so, this is a good one. Well, we won, but the point is... <laughs> One, you can only kind of get away with that stuff in a final, right? Because in a final, like, you, you have the crowd, and if you have the crowd on your side, right? And the, and the crowd, like, loved that, right? Because everyone loves Catholic bashing. Um, <laughs> but also, the point is, that was sold as much crazy than it actually is. Because it's very, like, given the way I just presented that, I rhetorically presented that to you as if it was that crazy. It's not actually that crazy to suggest that the Pope is complicit in covering up the child abuse. It's not actually that um, uh, controversial to suggest that this is a systematic crime, um, and given that we're talking about systematic rape, um, that is a crime against humanity. Like, you know, see the decisions of the International Criminal Court in Rwanda for details. Um, so actually, it's a, pretty, it's, it's, a, it's a lower burden of proof than you might think to go, this is international jurisdiction, the Pope meets, like, has a case to answer. Um, the rest of what happened in that definition was just there to make it look braver. Right? You can rhetorically make a case look braver than it actually is. Um, but it would have been utterly crazy if we were taking every single priest in the Catholic Church and holding them all jointly responsible. That would have been crazy land, because you can actually make the argument that the Pope is responsible. The stuff about the other Popes and digging them up was a joke, um, in case anyone was uncertain. Um, so... If you'd taken every priest and thrown them into prison, that would probably have been utter crazy land. But you can actually make a moral case that the Pope is responsible here, and so it's not crazy, but it is brave. And certainly, no one's going to be like, oh, you ran away from the issues here. Fourth. Um, it was a fun debate as well. And you get higher points in fun debates, you just do. Um, particularly in finals. Um, so, really, really, like, give it a try. Go for the issues. And also, if you've spent the first bit of your prep going, what is the issue? What were the judges thinking about when they set this motion? It's going to be easier for you to be like, it's going to be easier for you to avoid running away from the issues. Because you're like, we know, we've thought about this. We know that this is a crucial debate about this issue. So in defining it, let's go for this issue and try and win it. Um, other tiny things which I think it's possibly useful to remember in definition. Um, ways to kind of save time, if you will. They don't find that their definitions end up being too long. They are time-saving techniques, okay? The first I'm going to call definition by analogy. Um, we're going to legalize cannabis. There's a set of legal restrictions that are on uh, cigarettes right now. We're going to use exactly the same. We have just defined the motion. Everything, right? Everything you currently do with cigarettes. Like, you could have spent a minute and a half going, sale is going to be regulated, there's going to be a tax on imports, you know, children aren't going to be allowed to get it, we're going to be legalising it for recreational and for medicinal use, and it would have taken far too much of your speech. Or you could just go, this is going to be exactly the same as cigarettes are right now. We hope that's clear. And of course, that's going to be easier in a tournament in Israel, right, than it is in Euros or Worlds, because of course cigarettes are legalised differently in different countries. But definition by analogy, the idea that rather than go through the detail, you can just go, it's going to be like this. Um, in international relations debates, find me a precedent. 
So it's slightly different, right? right. Um, so debates about sanctions. We're going to put sanctions on Thailand until they you know, hold elections. Uh, the sorts of sanctions we're envisaging are those that were levied on apartheid South Africa. You might want to give a little bit of detail about that, but you could just go, these were very effective, they targeted the political elite, they worked through things like international shaming, we hope it's clear to all the teams what's going on, let's move on. Move on with your life and get on with your arguments. You can just like shorten the amount of time you spend on definitions by citing a precedent or by using an analogy. The other thing you can do, which is a little bit tricky, tricky um, is when the one-minute bell goes, you know, it goes bing, and you just go, and I'm happy to take a point of information now if any aspect of that was unclear. No, good. Right? Because if something in your definition was unclear, you should take a point of information then. So they give you a chance to, one, get the point for answering a point of information, but actually you're just clearing up a bit of the definition which you should have done anyway, and they've lost the chance to attack you. So yeah, everyone wins, apart from the other side. Um, yeah. Doesn't that though show that you're afraid that you missed something or that you defined it not clearly? Oh, no, 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 no. You just do it in a, I'm so nice, right? Like you don't do it in a, I'm very nervous. Was that okay, guys? You do it in a, and of course, if the opposition find any aspect of that unclear? No, no, didn't think so. Right? Like, you don't have, if you do it in a very nervous way, it will look like you don't have confidence in your own prop. But if you do it in a kind of, and we're all very nice and, you know, brotherhood, so, yeah, in the spirit of fair play, I'm going to take a point of information now. If any aspect of that definition was unfair, no, all right. But it's useful for you, because you might have fucked a bit up. You might have forgotten a bit. Every now and then, you will forget a bit. You will fuck up a bit of the definition. They'll stand up and go, you're doing this or this, and you'll stand up and go, oh, fair enough, we're going to do it this way. So sometimes it will help you. Like, you're inviting the opposition to help you. I mean, the opposition help themselves as well, because attacking an unclear definition is murder. Like, you don't want to be in a debate where you don't really know what you're attacking. So you want to stand up and ask a point of clarification and go, what? Um, is everyone familiar with what a point of clarification is? Mm -hmm. I never know how far this terminology sort of travels, if you see what I mean. Anyone not familiar is probably a better question. No? Fine. Um, that, I think, is everything I have to say about definitions. Does anyone have any questions about definitions? Yes, sir? If we take the motion of uh, banning abortion at all stages, would you include uh, rape uh, would pregnancies resulting from rapes and you know, pregnancies that involve any uh, risk for the lady, for the woman, would you include them in that definition? It would depend on what I was arguing. If I was arguing that the reason why we had to ban abortion was that it was murder, um, and therefore we are preserving life by banning abortion, then I probably will have an exception for cases where the life of the mother is at risk. Um, but if you really think it's a person, that the fetus is a person, then it shouldn't matter whether or not the woman has been raped. We don't, after all, allow rape victims to like kill their rapists personally. Um, so if I'm, if I'm running my argument that way, that you cannot have abortion because abortion is murder, then the definition just kind of drops out of your argument. You know what your definition has to be after you've worked out the argument, and that's probably how I'd run it in prop. And there'll be other ways of running it in prop, though. There'll be other ways of arguing for abortion that explain why it is all right to allow a rape victim to have an abortion. Off the top of my head, I can't think of it right now, but there will be a way of doing it, given how many people believe that. Someone will have worked out the argument for it. Does that make sense? Awesome. Any other questions for the moment? Yeah. Um, if you're paired with someone that you haven't been paired with for a long time, you, have, you haven't much experience working together, do you think that it's crucial that both uh, speakers will understand the definition before they can go on, understand it completely and clearly, or can the first speaker say, I think it should be this and this, and I, I mean, oh, should no. it get into proper yeah. matter time? Yes, yes it should. I mean, like, because, so, so the scenario you're talking about is, we haven't agreed on the definition, or you don't understand the definition, but we're going to write arguments anyway. We're, we're, discussing, we're discussing abortions, and, you know, am I going to go over every one of the, the distinctions, any one of the, you know, exceptions, any one of the exceptions? with my partner or just say, and there'll be several exceptions. Well, are these exceptions important? And if they're not important, why are they in the definition anyway? Okay, so you're saying... If it's an important exception, your partner needs to know about it. And if it's not an important exception, why is it there? So don't trust 
you know, your partner to understand the definition. He's writing his speech while you're up there. Oh. He's got other things to worry about. He's thinking of rebuttal the minute you sat down. Now your job's done. You're thinking of points of information from there on. The minute your speech ends, you're on points of information duty. That guy's got a speech to do. Um, if it's an important distinction, though, if it's an important part of the definition, everyone has to know what it is because your definition will be connected to every argument you give. Every argument should take you back to your definition. Every argument should push forward the whole case. And if an argument isn't connected to the definition, um, such that like, I could advance the argument without knowing what the definition is, that, 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 that sort of confuses me a little bit. But it certainly means that that person is very vulnerable to a point of information that just asks him to explain something. And if that person doesn't know what the definition is, they could easily knife you without meaning to. Um, so that's, that strikes me as dangerous. Like, if it's an important part of the definition, then both partners need to know it. Um, and if it's not an important part of the definition, it's not part of the definition. Can't. Um, does that make sense? Other questions? Yes, madam. I'm just interested. What was the rationale for you to say that in that debate about holding religious leaders responsible for the fanatics of their communities, what's the rationale to narrow that to the Pope and not use all the fundamentalist other religions? Like, oh. You had so much more kind of argumentative material if you hadn't narrowed the scope of the definition. Yes and no, because you're kind of defending too many things. So um, the Catholic Church is not organised the same way as like. Um, rabbinical authorities to say nothing of like the 50 bajillion different ways in which Islamic, different Islamic faiths organize themselves and all the rest of it. So advancing an argument for moral responsibility is extremely easy when you can focus on the Catholic Church. Here's why the Catholic Church is an organization with a paper trail, a hierarchy, um, that yeah, we know what the Pope knew, we have all the letters. So one, it gives the debate focus. And a debate about too many, a debate with too many examples often ends up with one side talking about one set of those examples and the other side talking about the other set. So debates about sanctions in general often end up with one side just talking about South Africa and the other side just talking about Iraq in the 90s. Um, and to that extent, there's very little clash. So this is a case where narrowing the debate, giving it a little more focus, creates more clash. But I'll be honest, the main reason why I did it is because I thought it would be funny. Um, and I was right. Um, <laughs> was it about... A pope or the pope? Like, oh, it was about it was about Pope Maledict the tenth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It was about Pope Maledict. And uh, it's not considered like time setting or place setting. It's not time setting. Uh, so um, rules on place setting um, are there. Is this a bit of terminology that doesn't travel? <laughs> time setting is if you're like this house is in 1915. We are the Ottoman state. We should surrender or something, right? Don't do that. Never do that. Place setting is, say the motion was, this house would assassinate dictators. Um, you stand up and go, this house is the United States. We are going to assassinate Robert Mugabe. That would be a place set. You narrow who's doing the thing, or rather you specify who's doing the thing, because you always need to say who's doing the thing, and you narrow the place to what particular dictator. Um, now, instead of being like, talking about sort of a hypothetical dictator in the world in general. Um, now, the, that, is, that is legitimate, and the test for whether or not it's legitimate is whether or not another team could have reasonably anticipated it. So if I stand up and go, we're going after Mugabe, that probably is okay. If I stand up and go, we're going after Rosa Otombayeva of Tajikistan, that's probably not okay. Right? Um, huh? Or did, did someone think that that's much more obvious? <laughs> so I was like... Oh, racists. Um, just don't follow African news, do you? Um, and that'll, that'll, that'll be grey areas, right? And so, if you're worried about that, then like, probably stay clear of it. But narrowing debates uh, is acceptable um, if the other side can reasonably anticipate it. That's the test as written in most judging guidelines. Um, and if you're in opposition and something happens and it's an example that you didn't think was coming, but you perhaps might have been able to think of it, so in a debate about dictators, like, you should have thought of Mugabe, right? Maybe, yeah? Sure, why not? So, so <laughs>